Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is John Scott, and I am an alcoholic. <laughs> and uh, it's by the grace of God, actions of Alcoholics Anonymous and sponsorship that I've been sober since December 19th, 1982. And for that, I'm awful grateful, and so are a lot of other people. Uh, I, I uh, really want to thank the committee for paying my way here, uh, and uh, and uh, this is a this is a neat deal for Cindy and I. We we screwed up our lives together for quite a while, and, and now we get to kind of enjoy uh, the, the actions of Alcoholics Anonymous and uh, and Al Anon. It's a, it's a, one of those things that if they you know, if you're new here tonight, you probably already, or today, you probably already heard this before, you know, don't make a list of the things that you want to happen because you're here, because you'll sell yourself short. Well, I'll guarantee you I would have not, held my head would have not been on my wannabes, you know. Uh, I have, uh, my, my my focus on what I wanted when I came into Alcoholics Anonymous was tremendously more narrower than what AA has given us. And, and uh, uh, it's just a pleasure and an honor to be asked to, to, to share anywhere that uh, uh, this is a beautiful spot. And the people here have just been absolutely fantastic. I, Cindy and I showed up at the airport night before last, and, and uh, uh, our person who was going to pick us up was Jack. And, uh, and uh, some of you people know Jack. He's, he's, I hear he's a big man around this AA port. And, uh, and he... Uh, uh, I don't know what it is, but here lately I've been real nervous about being on time and things like that. And I don't know where it's coming from. It's just driving my wife nuts. But anyway, uh, we're sitting there getting our baggage, and I'm looking around for Jack. And, and uh, you know, you, you, we we have this ability to just spot each other. It seems like, and, and uh, I've, I've never we've never had any problem finding the, our host. But I see this guy, and he's standing over there, and he looks like he's waiting for somebody. I tell Cindy, I says, I bet that's Jack over there. And, and now I forget what Cindy said. There's some remark that only an Alan and I would give a guy like me. And, and, and uh, so I go over and I introduce myself. I, I, I ask him, I says, is your name Jack? He says, yes. I says, are you waiting for somebody? He says, yes. I said, I said John Scott. He says, he says, I'm waiting for Mary. <laughs> well, he looked like he's an alcoholic, you know. So. So anyway, Jack has taken really good care of us. I, I'm going to have to go on a crash diet when I get home because I've got a lot of making up to do. Um, but uh, you, your, your, your baskets that you sent us up to the room, uh, uh, the pictures, uh, you guys are taking care of us just first class. Uh, I, I enjoyed your speaker last night, Miss Pat. Uh, Pat, Pat came. We have a conference that uh, we put on every year in Montana called Veritas Mountain Conference, and the first speaker in that first conference was Pat, and it it was during the middle of a hailstorm, and we had this barn, this tin barn that the speaker was speaking in, and it, it sounded like you was inside of a drum, and and you, we got the tapes of that meeting, and you'd hear her talk for a while, and then she, she had to quit, and then she'd talk for a while, and then the hail would hit again, and she'd just have to quit. I think that was like a three-hour meeting, and she, <laughs> I believe she only talked about 40 minutes, but it but uh, it's good to see you again, and, and I really enjoyed what you had to say last night. And, and I hear that this next speaker, this al speaker, is going to be pretty phenomenal. Uh, but you got to watch her. She has a tendency to stress the truth every once in a while. <laughs> you don't want to believe everything she says. That's for sure. I tell you that. And uh, I'm looking forward to the meetings this afternoon. And, and uh, uh, Vince, I always enjoy your talk. I'm looking forward to that. And I'm sorry in the morning we're going to have to jump in the airplane and head home to feed some cows, I guess. And, but uh, I'm awful tickled to be here. Uh, and uh, kind of a little extra bonus. My sponsor gets to be here. My sponsor's here, and I don't get to see him all the time. It's good to see him. Um, I, uh, I, I'm the kind of guy that really shouldn't drink. Uh, I, uh, I, I didn't think that for the longest time. I really didn't know what my problem was. I, I thought, for the longest time, I thought it was her. 
she was mainly my biggest problem that I had, it seemed like. And, and uh, I, uh, you know, people from time to time would tell me that I really needed to quit drinking, and I never could understand that because drinking gave me something that I did not have on my own. When I, when I was able to drink three or four drinks, it's like something happened almost magically, and I would begin to relax, and I could just take it easy, and it seemed like I could be present. And, and uh, you know, people tell you that you need to quit drinking. And I thought that was crazy. You know, there's no, you know, why would you do that? I mean, really, why would you quit drinking? I mean, that's, if I quit drinking, my head was going to fall off towards the end. You know, so I just wasn't interested in quitting drinking. I never was. I always, always liked to drink to get drunk. I never kind of drank. I just, I was not, I was not the kind of guy that had one or two drinks and quit. I, and, you know, people, I've heard people say that they would drink no matter what. Well, if I was going to come over to your house and you only had one or two beers, I'd just pass your house up because I'm going to go where I can get a lot of beers and a lot of whiskey. And my favorite drink was whiskey and, and beer, you know. To, and I, I didn't, I was, I didn't matter what I drank. I always loved every piece of, the only thing I didn't like was scotch. I didn't like scotch, but I drank scotch. I drank scotch, you know. <laughs> so, you know, I, I, I wasn't really very picky. You know, and and uh, it's kind of like me and my eating. You don't get to be this size being too picky. And and uh, I I uh, I enjoyed it. I had more fun drinking than anything in the world. I mean, I just you know, it's what made me feel. It's how I could communicate. Before you know, I was like, a, I was a social mis misfit before I knew I was a social misfit. You know, and I I couldn't carry on a conversation very well with anybody, but you get a few drinks in me, and I'll guarantee you what, I knew things. I have this secret weapon, this stuff that lays between my ears, this gray matter. It's it's the great liar that loves to lie to me, and I love to believe it. I've always loved to lie. You know, liars will tell you what you want to hear. You know, an honest guy, I hate honest people. You know, they'll sit there and tell you the truth. That hurts your feelings. I don't like that. I, I like somebody to just kind of build me up, and, and I believe this great liar. And Give you an example of how I used to operate. Uh, I'm in the ranching and farming business, and, and one year, uh, me and this neighbor of mine, we started, uh, it was turning into winter, and we had to find some hay for the cattle. And, and the way I, me and this guy used to find hay, we would uh, buy us uh, both a fifth of whiskey, get in the car, and drive around and look at hay. And, and, and we were both at the same bank, and this banker at the time was, the old banker had quit, and we got this new banker. And we had not met him yet, and we'd been buying hay all day. And, and uh, don't get ahead of me now. Uh, and we uh, we went into this. I drank in two places. I drank in the Northern Hotel, which was not too unlike this hotel. But I drank at the Keg Bar, which is uh, a completely the opposite. I mean, completely the opposite. And so this particular night, me and my neighbor friend, we went to the Northern Hotel, and. Lo and behold, there's this new banker. And we're sitting over here drinking, and we send this banker a drink. Nothing. I mean, nothing. No thank you or nothing. Well, you know what that means. We're on the list. You know, I mean, my my friend and I didn't talk about this, but I begin to know things. I'm that kind of guy. I know things that aren't true, but I believe them anyway. <laughs> and so we send him another drink about an hour later. Nothing. Now I know what's going to happen. I'm going to lose my farm because they're going to quit supplying me the money that I need. I'm going to have to leave the country, probably get a divorce. I mean, all this kind of, you know, I mean, it's just the way it works, you know. And the next thing you know, we send them another drink. Nothing. Now it's just seeming it. I mean, that's for sure. This is what's going to happen. I might as well pack my bag and leave now. And finally, after about uh, another two hours, the guy comes over. So that kind of gives you an idea how long we've been there. <laughs> and... Me and this new banker who I've never met got into an argument almost immediately about sheep. Now, I don't know nothing about sheep. <laughs> I, about the most I've ever done with a sheep is I've loaded them into a truck, and that's it. I don't know nothing about sheep, but I argued with him for over an hour about how you handle and take care of sheep. Now, then my friend, my neighbor, saw that we was in trouble and going downhill rapidly, and he says, we have to eat, we have to eat, and he finally gets me into the car with him and this new banker, and we're, the banker and I are in the back seat, my neighbor and his wife are in the front seat, and we're going to go to this restaurant to eat. And I don't know about you people, when I drink sometimes, I just get tired. And I, I just, I just, I just went to sleep in this new banker's car, or in his lap. And, 
<laughs> uh, in case you don't know it, that's how you impress a new banker. I just thought, I had to go back. This is long before I got into AA. This is probably a year before I got into Alcoholics Anonymous. I had to make amends to them. You know, the next day I go in there and my hat in my hand, and I'm sorry for being such a, you know, and all this kind of stuff. And he, he let it go. He let it go. But about a year later, after I was in AA for, oh, I don't know, six, eight months, one day I looked up and here comes this banker and he just leaves. <laughs> I thought, hot dog. This is not hot. And, and he hadn't gotten rid of me. We, we were still in business together. But he comes in there and he says, you know, he just got out of treatment 28 days. He says, you know, i got to tell you something, John. He says, remember that night that you and I got in a fight over the sheep? I says, yeah. He says, I don't know nothing about sheep. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's kind of how we operate, you know. We, we, if we don't think we know, we just act like we know. And, and that's, that's, that's how my life is whenever I'm drinking. And it, I, have this, I have this ability to be what I'm not, and I kind of liked it. But it got me to a place where my life was upside down, you know. I, uh, I've done a lot of different things. I, I've been in the ranch and farming business forever, but I was a rock and roll star at one time. You know, I mean, nothing like one extreme to the other. You know, I had a head shop for a while, you know, don't want to miss out on anything. And, and, uh, uh, I, uh, you know, I, I married a, uh, a groupie and, and, uh, it was like a bad dream. She wouldn't go away, so I had to take care of her some way. And I, I ended up, uh, you know, we, we were in love, and we had a great time for the longest time, but as I continued to drink, we got to a place where we absolutely despised and hated each other. And, and by the time I got to Alcoholics Anonymous, my mind was so crazy, and I was so twisted. I, I, uh, it, it, it was just insane. It was insane the way we treated each other. And uh, I, uh, I, I always like to remember... Uh, the day before I got here, which is December 18th, 1982, I woke up in the basement of a house. It was a friend of mine. I didn't really know where I was at. You know how we wake up, like you were talking last week. <laughs> you, know, you know, it's like, as always, you've got to try to figure out what the heck you've done. And I hated that part. I hated that part because you'd have to ask people in such a way that they don't know that you don't know. You know, and, and you'd have to kind of get a little pee. And you never wanted to ask her because she always gave it worse than what it really was. You know, you, and, and so, but I, I would, I kind of, if I remember right now, she'll tell you a totally different story because the way she remembers and the way I remember, most of mine's hearsay, you know, I, I was a blackout drinker, but what I remember is, I remember, I think, going out after bed on Thanksgiving Day, and this is about the, well, this is the 18th of December, so I, there's a gap, there's a, there's a gap in there, and, and I don't remember much of the gap, I just remember waking up in strange places and, Something about a river, or I don't, you know, losing pickups, uh, stuff like that. I, and so anyway, I woke up this morning in this friend's house, and we had to go find my pickup because somebody always steals my pickup in the middle of the night, takes it someplace that I never would go. And and uh, we we got the pickup, and uh, I I told this guy, this guy's name was Johnny. He was really old. He was about sixty years old. And and I told Johnny, I says, you know, I gotta quit this. I'm gonna I'm gonna end up killing my wife, or I'm gonna kill myself, or you know, I cannot do this anymore. I just cannot do this anymore. And I, you know, I, I was willing to do something different. A few months before then, about six months before, this guy named Frank that came out to my place. He, he was a feed salesman, and he came out there. And Frank and I was old drinking buddies, and and. And it was noon, and I was already drinking, and I poured Frank a drink, and Frank wouldn't drink it. And there's something wrong with Frank when he's not drinking. I mean, there's something really wrong. And and I and I said, come on, Frank, have a drink. And Frank wouldn't drink with me. Now, I'm kind of an obnoxious type of drunk. If if you don't want to have fun with me when I'm drinking, I'll just have fun with you while I'm drinking. And and, and I ended up uh, just tormenting Frank for hours. And he'd try to leave, and I'd just block his path, and I wouldn't let him leave. And we, and I sat there and drank with Frank for, I don't know, three or four hours, and he kept saying that he had to go, he had to get out, he had to go to a meeting. And I, what kind of meeting could be so important that you can't sit here and talk to your old buddy John? And finally he tells me he's going to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. I said, Alcoholics Anonymous, Frank, my God, isn't that, that's, you're kind of like overcorrecting a little bit, aren't you? I mean, <laughs> Frank, you don't drink any worse than I do. And Frank goes, yeah, I, I know. <laughs> and, 
And I said, you know, Frank, I've been thinking about it. My life is so stinking bad right now. I don't know. I, I don't think I'm an alcoholic, but maybe you guys can help me a little bit. Can I go to a meeting with you tonight? And he said, no. And, and I said, well, why not? He said, well, Frank, or Frank, he said, Frank says, uh, the reason you can't is because Alcoholics is Anonymous is for people who want to quit drinking and you're still drinking, obviously. And I can remember waking up that next morning and thinking, my God, this drinking is getting out of hand. I almost went to A&A last night, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but on December 18th, all this kind of came back to me again. And so me and this Johnny, this guy that I was drinking with, this old man, uh, we we uh, get in this car and we drive down to Frank's to talk to Frank a little bit about maybe joining up and because uh, we we needed to change the way we were doing things obviously and and uh, oh Frank was glad to see us he was tickled to see us and he you know come outside and he got this he had this questionnaire this little twenty questions you guys seen the twenty questions in A that nobody can pass you guys seen that <laughs> you, know, you know what's funny about that uh, I, every once in a while Cindy Zalanon gals come over and I let them take they they don't they can't even pass that test right you know. But if you're an alcoholic, there's no, there's, it's like foolproof. And, and, and I, you know, my secret weapon started working because I could figure this thing out really quick. You guys got a name like Alcoholics Anonymous, you've got to be hurt for membership. And so what you've got is you spend a lot of money getting some people to make this test that nobody can pass. And, and so I'm sitting there and I'm cheating. And, you know, it says if you lose, if you got two wrong, you might be, but if you got three, you're just, I mean, you're locked in. I don't know, 19 out of 20. You know, that's not even kind of, that's, it, obviously it's a trap, you know. And, and anyway, Johnny took the test, he flunked it too. And, and so <clears throat> we're, you know, we're a little bit nervous because I've been drinking for a long time since Thanksgiving, you know, and, and so I, I'm having, I'm having already, I've got this two or three six packs of beer because I'm, I'm nervous and that's what calmed me down. And Johnny was the same way, and Frank says, you know, he, he says, I'd like to take you guys to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. Well, can we go tonight? No, he says. And why not? Well, because Alcoholics Anonymous, if people want to quit drinking, you guys are still drinking. But he says, I'll tell you what, don't drink tomorrow, and I'll take you to a meeting. Drink the rest of the day if you want to, but don't drink tomorrow, and I'll take you to a meeting. Well, that sounded good to me. Cause, so me and Johnny went over to the keg bar, and the keg bar is, is well, it's not a very... Is not anything you think about is nice. It wasn't okay, and and I would sit. I got away. I always like to remember how it was that last day I drank. I sat over in the corner in the cake bar and I cried because I was alone. I mean, I was really, I was really having the time of my life. I got to remember how good it was when I was drinking, and I would sit over there and I just, you know, I just cry. I self pity, just waves of self pity. Just loved it, you know. Just oh my god, you know, have another drink. Put put it on. You was always on my mind by Willie Nelson, you know. I just, oh, I, yeah, because I, I, <laughs> you know. she was leaving me at the time, and I hated her, and she hated me. She'd been trying to kill me. I've been trying to kill her. I mean, we had a wonderful relationship. You know, I'd come home in the middle of the night, and she'd come out of the closet with a baseball bat, and, ah! you know. <laughs> but I'm not going to get into her story, show. So, but. Uh, uh, and and uh, there was abuse in our family. Uh, I uh, I and then you'd come over because I was sitting over there in, in the corner crying because I was feeling so sorry for myself, and you'd try to talk to me, and then I'd want to fight you, and you know, and then you'd leave, and then I'd cry because I was all alone, you know, and that's that's basically how my last day of drinking was. There was nothing flashy. That's just you know. And the next morning, Frank calls up. Cindy Cindy had a series of moving in and out, in and out, you know. Uh, I had a guy that I later sponsored that lived across the street from Cindy's house, and she, Cindy's mom's house, and he could, he says, I could always tell what was going on. He says, if, if the glad bags were there, I knew that she's going out. And if the Sansom, if you had the suitcases, I knew that she was going back to the house, you know, because I could move her pretty fast. I'd just load her, just load everything in the, Lad bag, throw it in the back of the pickup, throw it out on mom's lawn and see ya, you know. And, and uh, but if we was moving back, it was a totally different deal, of course. And, and uh, he, he laughed. He says, you guys entertain me all that summer. And, and uh, it's hard to sponsor a guy who thinks of you like that. But I, uh, I ended up, uh, you know, uh, that next morning, uh, I remember Frank called and told Cindy, he said, don't let him drink. Don't let him drink. Cindy laughed at him. Cindy was always kind of against my friends, you know. And she she laughed at him and says, you know, I'm long since tried to give, tried to pay any attention to what he does. He says, here, you talk to him. So he told me not to drink. And he says, uh, come in early. I want you to meet a guy. So I I go to this restaurant across the street from 
place that we was going to meet. And he says, uh, I want you to meet this guy. His name is, his name is Richard. Richard's my sponsor. And, you know, I, I got this secret weapon, and I know what the deal is. I, I know these things without any, any kind of evidence at all. Sponsor means that you got to pay them or else they got to pay you. And obviously, I'm going to have to pay these guys at least, you know, 50 to to $100 a month after they get you trapped and you got to come to these meetings. And so that's what this, you know, and I, I was kept going to ask Frank about how much he's paying Richard, but he, I never got around to that. But, you know, and Richard asked me a question or two or three or four, and it seems like, he, but he, he says, John, he says, I'm going to ask you a question. Do you feel like you're responsible for your own actions? Now, I've been trying to kind of get into AA for six months now. You know, they wouldn't let me in because I was always drinking. And, and I knew that the answer kind of had to be right. But I didn't like the answer that I kept coming up with. And, but I told him, yes, I feel like I'm responsible. And he says, good. Maybe now you'll start acting like it. And I knew right then that he'd been talking to Frank and Frank had been talking to Cindy. No, I, you know, <laughs> because how else would he know that kind of stuff? But the amazing thing about Frank, uh, Richard is he started to talking. Um, he started to talk about himself, about how he'd been. He was he was in the car business and working for General Motors, making a lot of money, doing really well. And he'd been sober for five years, and then he got drunk and almost killed him. And now he's sober again for about five years. And he starts talking to me about things that I knew that Cindy didn't even know. He started talking to me about things that was going on inside. You know, he he he. He had a way that he could, it's that one alcoholic talking to another alcoholic thing that seems like we are the only people that can really do that for each other. And he would tell me things about what he was doing in his life that I knew nobody knew. He told me about the way he felt, about how guilty he seemed, and about how, how he, he just hated what he was doing, and yet he could not quit. And that was me. That was me. And he, 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 he somehow conveyed to me the thought that Alcoholics Anonymous was very important in his life. And that Alcoholics Anonymous, not only was it saving his life, but it was giving him a life beyond his wildest dreams. It was allowing him to be something that he'd always wanted to be, but somehow never absolutely had the ability to do it. And so we went to that first meeting that first night, and I don't remember a thing about it. I don't remember who talked. I, I remember that there's another girl who raised her hand along with me, as a new person, I don't ever remember seeing her again. I don't remember who talked. I don't remember what the talk was about. I don't remember anything except for one little detail. And that was for the first time I felt something that I had not felt in a long, long time. And that's called hope. I, I remember just feeling a little because There is people in there. There is people in there that they were claiming that they had been sober for 15, 20, 25, 30 years. Now, come on. Come on, why, why would you do that to yourself to begin with? But to sit there and say that and lie like that. But there was a guy sitting next to me, and his name was Tim, and I asked Tim. I says, Tim, how long have you been here? And he says, I've been here two weeks. Now, I knew he'd been there for two weeks because he looked like he'd been there for two weeks. He was not happy. He was not one of these guys, well, life is wonderful. His life sucked. And, 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 I, and I believed that he was there for two weeks. And somehow he gave me a lot of hope. <laughs> you know, now, you know, we, it's so crazy about how we operate, you know. We, we, it's like we, somebody was talking here the last day or so about how what we say and what we hear is totally different. You know, what I say tonight has not, nothing to do with what you hear, it seems like, you know. And, and, uh, and uh, the older you get, the worse that is, I guess. Uh, but, but, but I, I've always heard things that weren't really being said for some reason. And and but yet I understood the message that Tim was telling me that he'd been there for two weeks and he'd been sober. And so I started coming to meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous. The first night I was there, my, a guy named Johnny. He says, uh, "You don't have a sponsor. I'm going to be your sponsor." Didn't ask me nothing like that. Just says, "I'm going to be your sponsor." He's the guy I'm going to have to pay the hundred dollars to. I know. And he says, "You come on over to my house right after the meeting." And we went over there, and he he had his kids come out and talk about dad being sober now, and his wife come out and talk about dad being sober. And he, you know, we looked at the book a little bit, and, and this happened for you know. Uh, he he says, "Now at two o'clock that night, he says, now you can go home because that's when the bars close in Montana." So two o'clock, I go home. And the next morning, he tells me to come back in. So I come back in about two. Two guys show up about 10 o'clock in the morning, and 
And uh, oh, they come over there with this concoction, this orange juice, kale syrup, honey, vi- a handful of vitamins, stuck it in a blender, says, drink this, it'll make you feel better. It didn't make me feel better, but I told them it made me, I was taking it long before I was, you know, and, and so I started drinking this stuff, and it just, you know, I, I felt better almost immediately. I didn't drink much of it. I can remember that. But then after that, two more guys would come and take me to lunch. After that, two more guys would come along and they'd take me to the meeting. And that night, Johnny would say, it's time for you to go home with me. So I'd go home with him. At 2 o'clock, he says, go home. So I'd go home the next morning. Johnny would have me come over to his place. I'd sit there until about 10 o'clock, two guys come by, take me to lunch. You know, and this went on for day after day after day. They were relaying me. And I, you know, it's like they was... You know, they were just having the time of their lives at my expense. You know, they'd laugh. Or, <laughs> I'd be telling them about how miserable my life was and how I hated my wife, and they just laughed. They thought that's funny. You know, and, and uh, but but they were kind to me. They were always kind to me. It seemed like, and and so little by little, I, I got to thinking that you know this thing might really work. And about 40 days into my sobriety, this Johnny, this guy who was my sponsor, he got mad at his group. He got mad at his sponsor, and he got drunk. You know, he got drunk. He had seven years of sobriety, and he got drunk. It's like, you know, what kind of deal is this? I didn't even know. I thought once you got into A, you couldn't drink no more. You know, that was what I was kind of being set up with, with Frank, you know. It's for people who want to quit drinking. And But he got drunk, and I'm going, wow. But I, you know, I, I went to a meeting that night. I've been thinking about this little blonde I've been looking. She had what I wanted, and I thought maybe, well, now's my opportunity to ask her to be my sponsor, you know. And, and this Richard comes out of nowhere. And Richard was a guy who smoked cigarettes just like this, a three-piece suit, you know, wingtip shoes, and always stood up really straight because he had a bad back. And somehow Richard maneuvered himself in front of me and this gal, and he says, uh, I'm going to be your sponsor now that your sponsor's gone. Well, Richard, I'm not sure whether or not I I said, I don't, I, I didn't ask you whether or not you wanted me. He said, I'm going to be your sponsor. He always knew what I wanted. You know, like I said, he was in the car business. He sold me a diesel car about a, two weeks later, which started a new series of arguments me and Cindy was having because she didn't like the car a bit. And uh, that because she didn't like nothing there for a long time. And, and I can, and I can remember, uh, you know, Richard, uh, you know, he, he just always seemed to have the ability to make me understand that whatever it was that he was asking me to do was in my best interest, it seemed like. And um, I, I always like to talk a little bit about the people that I got sober with, the, the older folks. There was, there was a gal named Millie there. And Millie was a, kind of a grandmotherly lady. She's just a sweetheart. And, and I'd be sitting there. Just as, just full of contempt, you know. And Millie would sit there and say, "John, look at all the miracles. Just look at all the miracles." And, you know, I don't see nothing. I don't know what she's talking about. She says, "You just keep coming back. One of these days you'll see the miracles." You know. There's another gal there named Margaret. Margaret. You know, you get in after a while. You know, after the first few weeks, you get to where you critique and everybody. At least that's what happened to me. I'm sure that nobody in here would do that. But you know, I get to where you kind of critique everybody's talk. And there's a gal named Margaret. And Margaret, you call Margaret, and she says, hi, my name is Margaret, and I'm an alcoholic. And them that go to meetings stay sober, and them that don't, don't. Thank you. Come on, I mean, something got a little more flashy than that, Margaret. And you'd call her Margaret two years from now, and she says, hi, my, my name is Margaret, and I'm an alcoholic. And them that go to meetings stay sober, and them that don't, don't. Thank you. No, don't call her Margaret no more. We know what she's going to say. <laughs> Then there's this guy named Gerald. Gerald was a guy from Louisiana. He 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 had a series of accidents. He ended up coming to Montana, and they threw him in the nut ward for a while in the state insane asylum. And he was freshly out, <laughs> and Gerald would sit there, and he'd start talking. If they called him Gerald five minutes after the meeting started, you knew who was going to be talking at the end of the meeting type of a guy. You know, jeez, don't call on Gerald. He just goes on and on about nothing, you know. And and uh, and Gerald thought that I Gerald thought that I had kind of a bad attitude one night. He and I don't know where he got that because I you know, <laughs> I I came in there and and uh, I, you know Gerald shook my hand. He reached out to shake my hand and asked me how I was doing. And I told him you know I hated my wife and hated my kids and hated my job and hated God and hated AA and hated and he says stop it. 
He said, I don't want to hear that crap no more from you. He said, from now on, when I ask you how you're doing, you're going to reach out, you're going to shake my hand, and you're going to say, why, Gerald, I'm getting better in every way every day. Thank you very much. <laughs> this is a rigorously honesty program, and they got me lying. Gerald's got me lying right off the bat. <laughs> Another guy in that group, his name was Rotten Ralph. Now, Rotten Ralph was an attorney, and he earned the name. Uh, Rotten Ralph would keep his dollar for the collection plate in his pocket. And if, say, some new guy was talking about how his wife was screwing up his life or something like that, and he got to talking a little longer than he should have, if they called him Ralph after that, then Ralph would just kill him. I mean, Ralph would just belittle him and humiliate him and just nail him. And then after he gets through with that, he pulls his dollar out and says, now, if I pissed you off, he says, let me be the first to buy you a drink with the dollar. Now, that's no way to treat a new guy. I mean, this is, love and tolerance is our code, you know. Obviously, Ralph had not heard that. Another guy in our group, his name, his name was Nick, and Nick was an old guy who, they, they said that he had the ability to nail you no matter how old you was in the program. He had the ability to say the right things at the right time. But he also, I remember Nick really well because he said there was no need for me, for him to remember a new person's name for at least a year because you're just a visitor. Just a visitor. Jeez. You know, and I can remember. I know that nobody in this group of people would think like this, but I thought, you know, I'm going to get that old fool. I'm going to I'm going to get him where he remembers my name one night. And so I asked him in my best newcomer tone, you know, if he had a few minutes. And I started to sit down. We sat down there on the couch. And there's only about eight or nine people left around the room. And, and I remember talking to Nick, Nick about Cindy and... Nick jumps up. He heard about five or six sentences that I had about me whining about how Cindy was treating me. He jumps up and he says, John, he says, so you're an alcoholic. Now, what the hell are you going to do about it? That's what I want to know. I don't want to hear about this other crap. I want to know what you're going to do about being an alcoholic. And it just humiliated me. And I can remember getting up and starting to leave. And Nick was Nick was a crippled kind of guy. And he hobbled over there and beat me to the door and pushed me up, pushed me up against the refrigerator. And he says, listen. He says, you're wasting your time, and you're wasting my time, and you're dang sure wasting uh, those guys' time. So he says, listen, why don't you just go ahead and get drunk if that's what you're trying to do? And out of nowhere comes Rotten Ralph over the top of his shoulder. Yeah, let me buy you a first drink. Let me buy you a first drink. Let me buy you a first drink. <laughs> I, can remember, I can remember running outside just, yeah, you know, I, I get in this diesel car, and there's a gravel parking lot, and I was going to spin gravel in it. Mm, mm, mm. <laughs> I'm driving home, and I'm beating on the dash, and I'm screaming. I, don't you think I was immature or nothing, but I was just going crazy. I was just going crazy. You know, hey, hey, ain't it better? It's worse. I, this is just insanity. I can't believe these people. They don't care. You know, it's like, and, and all I heard, all, and thank goodness I lived in the country. I had a long ways to drive. And I, all I can remember is Nick going, so you're an alcoholic. What are you going to do about it? So you're an alcoholic. What are you going to do about it? And something something in, in that drive home that night changed. And I'm not sure. I guess it's surrender is what you could call it. But at some point there, I it dawned on me, so I was an alcoholic. Now, what am I going to do about it? Am I going to keep whining about it, or am I going to start, or am I going to start moving forward? Am I, going to, am I going to start trying to hear what these guys are talking about? Because by this time, I believe that some of these guys did have the time that they were talking about having. And... Little by little, on the way home that night, I began to get more and more in my head that I probably needed to do the things that I needed to do to get sober. And these guys probably really did have an answer for me. And I can remember that next night. I, I get in that car, that diesel car that my sponsor sold to me that Cindy hated. And I, I'm driving to that meeting, and, and God, just, oh, man, I mean, you know what's going to happen. You know, Margaret's going to sit there and say the same thing she said last night. You know, Gerald's going to say, hey, John, how you doing? Well, Gerald, I'm getting better in every way every day. Thank you very much. You know, and it kind of dawned on me that, well, maybe I am. Maybe I am. Nick's not going to remember my name, but who cares? You know, and i got to give Ralph his damn dollar back, you know. And, and, and so... So little by little, things begin to change a little bit. And, and Richard asked me, how is my relationship with my wife going? Now, I know he knew because I've been telling everybody, you know. And, and he'd certainly been talking to Frank, you know, a spy. I knew he was a spy. Come to find out later, Frank didn't even tell him nothing, you know. He already knew. That, that's how it is here, you know. I always hated it for, for the longest time. People knew more about me than I did, you know. 
and, and I, I find myself little by little starting to talk to him about what's going on, and I just can't stand it. And I, I, he asked me, he says, are you, what's going on with your relationship? Well, I'm getting a divorce. He says, now, let me understand this. Are you the one who's getting a divorce, or is she getting a divorce? I said, I'm getting a divorce. It's been a lot of money so far, too. He says, well, you'll quit that right now. I said, wait a minute. <laughs> You, you don't know how crazy she is. Oh, she says, I got a good idea. She's probably plumb out of her stinking mind if she's been married to you for 13 years. <laughs> he says, but we're not gonna, you're not gonna do that. He said, we don't try, we really try not to take any sudden actions for a year, and that would be a sudden action for you. He says, besides that, he says, you don't know how to have a relationship. He says, so what you get to do is you get to go home and you start to practice with her. And one of the first things you're gonna start doing is you're gonna start treating her like you like her, like you love her. And he's, and, and, and he says, you're going to have to start treating her special. And all of a sudden, my ears started going up a little bit because it had been a long time since I'd been back in the big bed, you know. And he says, no, 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 that's not what I'm talking about. <laughs> he, 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 says, he says, what you get to do is you start, you start carrying out the garbage a little bit. You, you, maybe you take her out to supper every once in a while. Clean up your, after yourself when, when you're taking a shower. So he says, start doing kind and lovable things to her. He says, you don't have to believe it. But you have to do it. You know, and I said, I don't think I want to do it. He said, I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. If you do this, and if you do it right, and you work at it, it will drive her crazy. <laughs> All right, I believe I'll try it. <laughs> and it did. Yes. <laughs> it just... <laughs> There were, there was times, seriously, I was, I was, I was about this time I was doing my first, my first four step inventory and, and she was, she was not a kind and loving Alan. And I know there are kind and loving Alanons out there, but, and I don't mean to be taking your inventory. I'm shooting you straight in this out later, but <laughs> she, she was not kind and loving. She, she would, she, she got really mad that I was going to Alcoholics Anonymous after about four or five months for some reason, you know, because I was doing it wrong. Apparently I wasn't sober enough the way she wanted me to. And, and I, I, uh, I can remember she'd stand in the doorway and stop me and, and she was pretty good at taking my inventory. And, and, uh, I had this fourth step inventory made. And I said, well, now wait a minute. After she got done, I said, you left out some things. And I started reading these off and it just, you could just see it just, she didn't know what to do with it. It was lovely. And she just turns away muttering and walks off. You know, it's just great. It was great. <laughs> AA, AA, AA was working good in my marriage anyway. And, and uh, little by little, things started to change, you know. I, and she, she started going to some al or AA meetings, open AA meetings, and things started to change. But it was an amazing process how this thing worked, you know. Uh, Richard would take me through that book, and he, 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 showed, me, he showed me in there about... Uh, uh, the doctor's opinion, how, how we, we have this allergy coupled with a mental obsession, you know. And, and I understand a little bit about apples. Um, I have allergies to apples. I, I take a bite out of an apple and my face swells up, my chest swells shut, and I can't breathe, you know. And, and it's an amazing deal. That's an allergy. Well, they're talking about this allergy with alcohol. Well, that doesn't happen. When, and he says, well, it does in a way, because what happens to you when you – drink alcohol, you break out in spots like Denver and Detroit and Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I got to thinking about that a little bit, you know, and really what happens with this Apple business is the doctor said, and if you're the newest person in the room, you know, you know what the answer to this. The doctor says, don't eat any more apples. Now, this is not deep. <laughs> this is not deep. And I've never had any trouble eating any more apples. I didn't have to go to AA, Apples Anonymous. I, 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 I didn't have to go to weeks and months and years of therapy. I just quit eating apples. I mean, I, I don't eat. Sometimes whenever I'm at a fancy restaurant and I'm looking over there and those people are having fruit salad, tears don't come to my eyes. You know, it's just no big deal. It's no big deal. The difference between my allergic reaction to apples and my disease I have with alcoholism is that I have no obsession. I don't, the, the mental part, the, the book talks about our problem is centered in our minds, not in our bodies. I mean, once we take a drink of alcohol, it simply tastes like more for me. But when I quit drinking, when I quit drinking, there's like a little spring in the back of my head, a little man that sits there and starts keeping score about how Somehow, even today, about how I've been screwed over, how things are really not working, you know, how, how, 
you know, a drink would somehow make it better. You know, it's like there's that little nagging feeling that comes out of nowhere every once in a while. You know, uh, my, my sponsor used to call them the poison darts. He says you always get the poison darts, these little thoughts that you have. But he says you don't have to think about them. You can brush them aside. And and that's what AA does for me. It allows me, the, it gives me the ability to brush those things aside. You know, it's. I think everybody who's an alcoholic gets them. You know, but you don't have to dwell on them. When I get, I get scared when I start thinking about them. You know, because the truth of the matter is, is I'm, I'm still allergic to alcohol. It's just like I'm allergic to apples. You know, it's been a long time since I had an apple, but I'll guarantee you, if I take a bite of an apple today, my swell, my chest will swell shut, my eyes will shut, swell up, and I won't be able to breathe. Same thing with alcohol. And that's kind of the trap that we have in here, it seems like. It seems like once we quit drinking for a while, we, you know, we have this feeling that we begin to be exempt, you know. It's like, well, it really wasn't that bad. Or what, you know, we just develop these thoughts. The reason I come to meetings on a real regular basis is because my mind leaks. I forget who and what I am. I'm an alcoholic of the hopeless variety, and whenever whenever I, I take a drink of alcohol, it doesn't matter whether it was last week or 10 years ago or 20 years ago, I'm still going to have that ab- abnormal reaction. And that, you know, that's what that second step is about. It's about somehow restoring me to sanity about that thought, pro- thought process prior to taking that first drink, that somehow, someday I'm going to be able to beat the deal. It's not, it's not there. It's just not there. I'm not going to be able to beat the deal. Once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic. And little by little, you work through the steps and you look at what's going on and what, what makes me tick. And that's what I like about Alcoholics Anonymous. I always have. It helps me understand me. I, I'm a goofy kind of a guy. I, 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 I am a, I have this uncanny ability not to be present in my own self. You know? It's like I'm just going along and I'm feeling bad, but I don't have any, I don't have any idea in the world of why I'm feeling bad, but I know it's bad. It's like it's like a cloud hanging over the top of me, you know. It's like, what what is it? And it's usually something that has nothing to do with anything. It's just all of a sudden it dawns on me, oh, that's what it was, no big deal, you know. And little by little, if I keep coming back to Alcoholics Anonymous and keep working the steps, keep doing what we're supposed to be doing, especially working with new guys, it seems like that stuff. This stuff kind of clears itself up, and I don't think as goofy as I used to think. Now, don't get me wrong. All I got to do is quit doing this a little bit, and all of a sudden that comes right back. comes right back. So I'm the kind of guy who needs to keep going to meetings, and I've been very fortunate. I've been I, I've been richly blessed. I've, I've got a bunch of guys that have asked me to be their sponsor, and I've had really, really good sponsors. I've had five sponsors, by the way, one at a time. Yeah, if I had two at a time, I'd be taking the path of the least resistance every chance I had. But one at a time, but I'm, I'm hard on sponsors. They're all dead except for that one right over there. <laughs> I asked him to be my sponsor. He says, John, I don't know. I think you're a carrier. <laughs> it's a, it's been an amazing journey though. It really has. You know, I, I really, I really am thankful for the the sponsors that I've had, because every one of my sponsors have impressed upon me how important Alcoholics Anonymous is and how it's it's important for me to treat it like it's important. It seems like it's one of those deals that the more you give, the more you get. My my first sponsor, Richard, he he told me he says, you know, John, he's, I came to I came to a meeting one time just. You know, I've been working on some machinery, and I was just filthy. And we all sat in the back. And he says, get away from me for crying out. Like, go sit over there. Somebody might think I know you, you know, and, and which was not good. And then after, and then he says, and by the way, after the meeting, you and I, you and I, which was, no, I, mean, I knew I was in trouble. But anyway, I come, I come after the meeting. I went over there and talked to him. He says, look, he says, this thing has literally saved my life. This thing, this Alcoholics Anonymous, this, this fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous has literally saved my life. He says, if you will allow it, it will save your life too. But don't you ever come here dressed like that again. He says, because, listen, he says, you need to respect Alcoholics Anonymous. The Alcoholics Anonymous do just fine with or without you. But he says, you need to respect Alcoholics Anonymous. And he says, you, you have very little respect for anything out there. He says, so let's start here. And, and I've, I've always kind of tried to do that a little bit. He was on me because my language was bad. And he says, clean it up. Clean it up. And he says, 
it's one thing to dress drunk when you're sober, and it's another thing to talk drunk when you're sober. He says, we are examples. We're all examples of the program that's saving our lives. So he says, for crying out loud, act like a good one. He says, you may be a bad example, but you get to choose. Do you want to be a good example, or do you want to be a bad example? And ever since then, it's like somehow I really wanted to be a good example. I wanted to, I wanted, I always kind of wanted to be a good friend to other people. I always kind of, I always wanted to be somebody who, who stood for integrity and commit, and being able to make a commitment and have some, have some decency, you know. And it seems like for the longest time, especially when I was drinking, there was none. There was none. And that's the thing that I seem to have hurt and missed the most is that ability not to be who I who I really wanted to be, you know. And Alcoholics Anonymous has given me all that stuff. Um, I'll tell you how crazy I am. My, my sister had a store that was uh, going broke, and, and she was severely depressed. She was not one of us. She was, she was just absolutely having a hard time. My family asked me to help with the store. Now, I know nothing about the store. It was going downhill pretty much whenever I got hold of it, and then when I got hold of it, it went straight down. And and, and uh, one day, uh, I was sponsoring this guy, and he asked, uh, uh, he'd asked me to sponsor him a few months earlier. He was a very wealthy man, and he uh, uh, he fired me that day because, uh, well, he thought I was overcorrecting. I was doing way too much, and he, I was trying to ask him to do more than he should. And uh, uh, so he fired me as a sponsor. And he was a pretty good salesman. He had me pretty well convinced that he was probably right. I was probably doing too much. And, and uh, uh, right after that phone call, I called my sister and asked her if she wanted to go out to have lunch that day. And she said she'd be really glad to do that because she was just cooped up in her house. So I went to pick her up and I told her that I'd been thinking about what this guy was talking about. And that the truth of the matter is, I'd probably overcorrected. I really wasn't that bad, you know. Whenever I was new, I had, a, you know, I had this problem with Cindy. But now we've got that thing cleared up. We're, I'm, I'm pretty, I'm pretty good. It really wasn't that bad. I mean, yeah, I drank every once in a while. And she started laughing, and I couldn't figure out what was so funny. But she, she, I mean, she really got down. She hadn't laughed in months, and she got down. She says, "Get me to a phone station right now." So I drove her to the phone station. She runs in the bathroom, and she comes back out after a few minutes, still laughing. I says, Maggie, what is so stinking funny? She says, my God, you are crazy, aren't you? And I said, what are you talking about? She says, don't you remember? Don't you remember? She says, the last three or four years that you drank, you never drew a sober breath. Don't you remember how it was? And I guess, like I said, my brain leaks. I guess you just forget that kind of stuff every once in a while. So I, I decided that my best course of action that night was just go to another meeting. Just go to another meeting. And it seems like sometimes that that's all we do. But if you're a person like me, that's a really good idea, you know. And if AA is starting to get really boring for you, and it's not like it used to be in the olden days, you might find a new guy to work with. It's amazing how fresh it gets, you know. I tell you what, there's nothing like it to see the lights come on and a guy who's been hurting really bad, or a gal, it doesn't matter, you know, just to see the lights come on. Just to see the hope return, you know. And that's... That's something that we've all been given. We've been given a great gift to be able to help each other. So we can help each other when nobody else can. You know, and see, if you're like me, sometimes we get so busy. Just busy. You know, got to go home watch the football game, whatever it is. But we're busy, you know. And, and uh, you know, I got to remember who I am and where I came from and how fortunate I have been. How, how, how I have been given this great, great gift. So it's absolutely... It's, it's not a chore to go to those meetings. It's not a chore to take that phone call. It's not a chore to be a, to be accountable to people. You know, uh, some folks just don't like to be accountable. And I'll tell you, it, it's, you're missing out. You're really missing out. Because there's a lot of times that I get to thinking, well, you know, this is enough. And uh, somehow it just seems like uh, when I get to thinking like that, my life gets dim. It just gets dim. You know? um, if you're, if you're, yeah, and another thing about the group, it seems like we, I, I had a, I've got a daughter who's this year got 16 years of sobriety. And that's one, that's one of the great gifts that Alcoholics Anonymous has given to me is whenever she was ready, she ends up, we, we ended up, now she wasn't an alcoholic, I can tell you that right now. You know, I, I'm talking to my sponsors at that time, it's Jim and I says, Jim, listen, she's, she's an, I mean, I've drank more, I've spilled more than she'll ever drink. 
you know, he says, let me, he says, let me talk to her a little bit. So he talked to her, he gets me back. He says, John, you let her go to knees. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I took her in there, and the gals in AA surrounded her and took care of her and pointed her in the right direction because they were, they were activists in AA. They were willing to take time to sit down and visit with her because that she's been here ever since. So I, you know, I think it's really important that we take care of our home groups and that we that we make sure that we're carrying the message of Alcoholics Anonymous and not something else. And it's easy for us to do that because we're always busy doing something, it seems like. But little by little, little by little, if I keep taking care of my home group, I keep taking care of me, it seems like. If you're new here tonight or today and, and uh, you know, it's just not really, it's not really kicked in for you just yet. Just don't leave. Don't leave. And I know it sounds so lame. They, they always got these dumb sayings in alcoholics and others, you know, one day at a time. You know what that means. That means forever. <laughs> yeah. One day at a time means forever. I don't care. You can say it however you want to, but that's what it means, you know. Uh, and and uh, But I, I got to tell you, if, if you keep coming back, one of these days you'll begin to see the miracles. And I've got to tell you, right now today, right now, in this room, there are a tremendous amount of miracles. There are a tremendous amount of miracles. My host is telling me about some of the miracles in his life. I tell you what, it is phenomenal what happens here. We get to expect it after a while. Oh, yeah, that's right. Did you hear about Jim? Yeah, yeah, ain't that phenomenal? Yeah, it's just fantastic. But that's, that's nothing. Listen to what happened to Joe. You know, I had a guy that I was sponsoring one time. And he was having some financial problems. And I was watching him. He wouldn't put nothing in the plate. He wouldn't put nothing in the plate because his business was going downhill. Well, him and another guy was partnering on this business, and he, he they just wasn't making enough money. And I said, well, I know this won't work, but why don't you try putting $5 in the plate instead of $1 in the plate when it goes by? I, he says, I, ain't got a, I don't have the money for $1. I said, just try it. Just try it. So he tries it for about a week, and funniest thing happened. Now, this is not going to happen to everybody, but the funniest thing happened. Whenever the week was over, he comes to me and says, you won't believe what happened. I said, what happened? He says, my partner was part of the witness protection program, and they spotted him, and he's gone. He's just gone. So I got the whole business. I said, there you go. <laughs> now, I don't know how that works, and that won't work for you, so don't try it. But... <laughs> But, you know, you just kind of get to expect that kind of stuff. It's an amazing deal what happens here. It really is. If you're new here tonight and and uh, you want to know the secret. See, I used to think that these guys were going to secret meetings for the longest time because whatever they was getting, I wasn't getting. But I got to tell you, if you're new here tonight, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a secret, something that I learned along the way here that seems to really, seems to really have helped me in a great deal. And it goes like this. Them that go to meetings stay sober, and them that don't, don't. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.